Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at passages like this one, as we've been doing for the last few weeks, because Jesus says that the Old Testament is all about him, all of it. In John chapter 5, he is in a, a debate with the Jewish scholars, the theologians of their day, the biblical interpreters of his day. And he said to them, if you really understood the text, you would know that it was all about me and you would come to me. At the end of uh, Luke's gospel, after Jesus has been executed on the cross and he's risen again, he comes alongside two disciples who are despondent because they had not understood that Jesus was going to be raised from the dead. As far as they were concerned, their hope, the Messiah, the King of Israel, had been executed by the Romans, and uh, their hope was dashed. And they're walking along the road to Emmaus, and Jesus walks with them. They don't recognize him, and he asks them what's going on, and they explain their disappointment, and he opens the scriptures, and from the beginning, from the books of Moses right the way through to the prophets, he explains to them what had to happen concerning the Messiah. And as he leaves and they realize they were speaking with Jesus, they say to themselves, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us? You see, the Bible is the place where we encounter the risen Jesus. It's the place that we learn about him, but it's also the place where we meet him. And this year, as we are kind of focusing our attention around encountering God, we thought it was a a good place to start, to start with the Bible, to start with the Old Testament, and to meet Jesus there. And so this is the last of a series that we've called Jesus on Every Page. And we've been on a little journey through uh, what is known as the Torah, the first five books of the New Testament. And we've looked at Christ's planet, and we've looked at Jesus in the creation stories, We've looked at Christ's promises and we've thought about uh, Jesus in God's covenant, his agreement, his treaty with Abraham. Last week, Darren looked at Christ's past and we saw that Jesus was even in the history of the people of Israel as they made their way through the wilderness. And today we're looking at Christ's precepts. Can you really even see Jesus in the law? And of course, the law in our culture, it's not a a positive thing, is it, really? Our culture rejects rules and commandments. We think they're restrictive and oppressive. They somehow choke who we really are. And yet, I want to suggest this morning that Jesus is on this page too. So we're going to look at Jesus in the law. We're going to look at five things. Command, temple, sacrifice, priest, and festival. Let's see how we do. Let's begin with the first one, command. These commandments that make up the law show us how to live. That's what they're there for. The law tells us, Leviticus tells us, if we keep God's commandments, then not only will we thrive as human beings, we'll flourish, we will be distinct as the people of God, we'll be different from those around us, and most importantly, perhaps of all, we will be right with God. We will be holy key term in the book of Leviticus. Now these rules aren't, these commandments, these laws, they're not arbitrary. They are, they reveal God's holiness. They're rooted in his character. So uh, God says, be holy. Why? Because I am holy. God is holy. That means he is absolutely incompatible with sin. It means that we can't just approach God. He's much too awesome for that, much too pure for that. And the laws reflect that character. The laws tell us that God is holy and perfect. But the law also reveals our sinfulness. Because the law doesn't just say, this is what holiness looks like, it looks like God. It also says, this is what sin looks like, the opposite of holiness, and that looks like us. Everyone, it says, sins. It's a universal problem that needs to be dealt with. And it unpacks what that sin looks like. It says we sin in different ways. Uh, So we can see that in our passage, verses 16 and 21, talk about sin as disobedience, transgression, 
law-breaking, where we know what we are doing and we, we rebel against God's commandments for us. But that's not the only way Leviticus talks about sin. It also describes sin much more like a disease, like pollution or contamination. And that, you can see that in verse 16 as well. It talks about being unclean, a kind of breaking a taboo. And it's a disease, if you like, that is easily contracted through contact with the wrong kinds of food, uh, sex, death, disease. And in this instance, often we don't know what we're doing. We don't realize we've been polluted or contaminated. But, says Leviticus, both matter to God because God is holy. And so these laws, these commandments, they reveal a problem, don't they? Can you see it? reveals a holy God, it reveals that the rest of us, we're all sinful. Now the Israelites thought that the law made them special, that keeping these rules somehow defined their identity, that those who weren't Israelites, non-Jews, the Gentiles, they were the sinners, but as those with the law, the Jews were holy. They were the ones who kept the rules. But actually they were wrong, and this is the problem. No one could keep the law. Paul, the apostle who wrote most of the New Testament, was himself a very observant Jew. He kept the law better than anyone else. And yet in his letter to the Romans, this is what he says. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. That's what it does. So it doesn't ever get us right with God. It can't do that. Nobody ever gets there. Instead, it just makes us all realize how sinful we are. So the law, in one sense, was supposed to tell us how to relate to God, but all it does is show us that that is not possible. That's a problem, isn't it? What can be done? Well, the great news is, is that the law itself contains within it kind of clues that point towards the solution. You see, as we read in this passage, the law isn't just commands, it's not just rules, it's not just laws, it's also rituals and ceremonies. And these rituals, they, they point forward to something new, something to come, something for everyone. So let's move from command to temple and begin to unpack some of these rituals. Because the temple is the place these rituals take place. The first thing to say about the temple or the tabernacle, which was basically a tent, a mobile temple, as the people of God were on the move. The temple or the tabernacle is the place where God lives. And... uh, You need to place Leviticus in its context in the Bible, and it comes straight after Exodus. So you remember last week, Darren was looking at uh, where we saw Jesus in the wilderness. So Jesus is in the wilderness as the people eat bread from heaven, the manna. Jesus describes himself as that bread. Uh, You remember they get thirsty in the wilderness, so God says, strike the rock and water comes out. Paul describes Jesus as the rock. Well, the climax of Exodus is the building of the temple of the tabernacle. There are these extraordinary instructions. And Leviticus kind of builds on that foundation because it's the temple, the tabernacle, that is the place of encounter. It's the the dwelling place of God. It's his house, if you like. And it was separated out into the holy place and the most holy place. And in the most holy place, the presence of God dwelt there. God's glory descends there in a cloud. It's visible, it's tangible, it's thick, it's real. It's perhaps reality itself. And Israel knew their God was with them because he was there in the tabernacle. But there's a problem. There's always a problem. The temple can be contaminated by sin. The sins of the people pollute the temple. As the people of God become over-familiar, they they take God for granted, they don't worry so much about his holiness, and over time this contamination builds up, and so you need to purify the temple every year, which is exactly what we read about in chapter 16. 
Because if that purification doesn't take place, God might just leave the temple. Then what would they do? So that is the temple, the the place where these rituals occur. First ritual, the key ritual that takes place in the temple is the sacrifice. The temple was the place where sacrifices were made. And Leviticus builds on this foundation from the end of Exodus and goes straight into describing for us the different types of sacrifice that God asked the people of God to offer. What does a sacrifice do, you might wonder? Well, there are a number of different sacrifices listed for us. You can read them in chapters 1 to 7. Sacrifices, at their simplest, express gratitude to God. They're just a gift to say thank you, a bit like a bunch of flowers. You might offer the first fruits of your harvest or the the firstborn of your flock. Leviticus describes those as free will offerings or fellowship offerings. You're enjoying a good moment with God. You're having a meal with him, celebrating his goodness to you. But sacrifices weren't just gifts. They also, in some sense, made things right with God where something had gone wrong. So Leviticus understands a sacrifice as something that purifies us. So it it cleanses this contamination, this pollution. So the blood of the sacrifice acts as a spiritual disinfectant. It makes things clean. It restores spiritual hygiene again. And this is described as the sin offering where this pollution is cleansed. In verse 6, we see that with the bull. And verse 15, with the first goat that are offered. And the blood, if you notice, is sprinkled on the around the temple. It cleanses the temple from this pollution, from the effects of that contamination. It cleanses the high priest. It cleanses even the people of Israel from this pollution. So the sacrifice purifies. The sacrifice also acts as a substitute. It takes the place of the person offering the sacrifice. So the sins you see here are confessed over the second goat. And then the animal is sacrificed in the place of the sinner. In this instance, the second goat is sent out into the wilderness where it dies. This is the guilt offering, where sins are atoned for, where the sacrifice is effectively punished instead of us, in our place. But again, there's a problem. You see, one sacrifice only dealt with a specific sin or situation. Sometimes you had no idea you had committed a sin. So you might not even offer a sacrifice. And if you did, you had to repeat these sacrifices again and again and again. There was no assurance, there was no security, no guarantee that you were actually right with God. So you had the temple, you had the sacrifice. Then, of course, you had the priest. In our reading, it's the high priest. The priest is the one who offers the sacrifice on your behalf. You need a priest to offer a sacrifice that is acceptable to God. The priest, in that sense, is a mediator between you and God. You can't get to God without the priest. Now, in an ideal world, the priest was a holy man. He led led a good life. He was part of the right family. He's the one that makes the sacrifice for you and intercedes on your behalf. But guess what? There's a problem. The priest has to be incredibly careful what he does. The high priest here is only allowed into the most holy place, the place where God dwells, once a year. And as he went in, it was, it was fraught with danger. It was an incredibly risky thing to do. They wrapped a rope around his waist, and it went out of the tabernacle. So in case something went wrong and he was killed by the presence of God, the people could pull him back out again without putting themselves at risk. You know, it was like going into a, a kind of... Uh, Chernobyl or something like that where there's just radioactivity that could just overwhelm you in an instant. It was a dangerous thing to do. And it was dangerous because the priest was a sinner just like everybody else. And so he has to take these precautions. He has to wear the right clothes. He has to offer sacrifices for himself before he can offer sacrifices for the nation. 
He has to burn incense so that he can't see God because if he sees God, that's it, the end. But it's very easy to get it wrong. So right at the beginning, verse, verse one and two set the context of this chapter. It's after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. They hadn't kept these rules. They'd got it wrong. Their sacrifice was rejected and they were exposed to the holiness of God and they died. That's a problem. So we've, what have we looked at? We've looked at temple, sacrifice, priest, lastly, festival. You see, sacrifices were offered at particular times of the year. Festivals and feasts, they're an important part of, of Old Testament life. So the book, book of Levit Leviticus talks about them in chapters 23 and 24. And they celebrate a variety of different things. Sometimes they, they simply celebrate God's provision for the people. So uh, the festival of the first fruits or Pentecost celebrate God's harvest that he'd been faithful to them for another year and given them the food they need to eat. Sometimes those festivals celebrated God's salvation. So last week, Darren looked at the, the, the festival of the Passover and, and the lamb that allowed Israel to be saved from Pharaoh as they escaped Egypt. There was also the festival of shelters or booths uh, where um, they celebrate receiving the water in the wilderness. And this festival is the Day of Atonement, the most significant festival of all. The Day of Cleansing. Jews still celebrate it, called Yom Kippur. It's the holiest day of the year. It's right at the beginning of the new year, so you can kind of uh, clear the slate. You can start again. All the pollution from last year can be dealt with. That's the first goat. All the buildup of that contamination can be eradicated. Your sins can be purged. That's the second goat. All your rebellion uh, and uh, law-breaking can be dealt with as that goat is sent away into the wilderness. So what you can see in this whole system of ritual is it's really difficult to get it right. You need to be in the right place, with the right gift, with the right person, at the right time. And what we see as we look through the history of the Bible is that something goes wrong. This doesn't work. God's people don't keep his commands. The temple is contaminated, so Ezekiel 10 uh, describes God leaving the temple. Jesus prophesies the temple is going to be destroyed, and then in AD 70 it is, and the sacrifices cease, and the Levitical line of priests ends. Is that all a failure? What was this elaborate system for? Well, the writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament tells us, and he tells us it's all about Jesus. If you'd like to turn to it, turn to page 1139. And look at chapter 5, verse 7. You see, Jesus is the one who keeps the commands. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learnt obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus keeps God, God's commands. Jesus enters, says the book of Hebrews, a better temple. Chapter 9, verse 24, turn there. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one, the temple. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. He enters a better temple. Jesus offers, says the writer to the, book of he, uh, to the Hebrews, he offers a better sacrifice. Look at chapter 7, verse 27. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. So Jesus offers a better sacrifice. Jesus is a greater high priest. 
Chapter 7, verse 23. There have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus is a greater high priest. And Jesus fulfills the day of atonement. Chapter 9, verse 12. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Jesus fulfills the day of atonement. You see, Jesus, he lived his life for us. He keeps the commands. Jesus is the place we meet God. He's the better temple. Jesus cleanses us from all our sins. He's the better sacrifice. Jesus saves us completely. He is the greater high priest. And Jesus sheds his blood on the cross for us. He sums up all the festivals in the Old Testament. Jesus is on this page. These are Christ's precepts, his laws. And it's because Jesus is on every page. We looked at Christ's planet. We looked at Christ's promise. We looked at Christ's past. We've looked at Christ's precepts. All of these things on every page that we read, we meet Jesus there.